Yeah. Uh, thank you all for coming today. Uh, we have uh, Roland from SmartPy today, and SmartPy is a uh, Python Python uh, based smart contract library uh, for Tezos, and then they also have a uh, online IDE for development in the in, in the browser. So he's going to give us a quick presentation about SmartPy first, and then you know work through three different smart contract examples. Um, and during this process, if you have any questions, feel free to toss it into the Q&A or the chat and the, um, you can answer them. And at the end, we can end with the Q&A session. So yeah, thanks, uh, Roland, uh, take it away. Thank you. So um, as Spencer already said, um, SmartPy is a Python library for writing smart contracts for the Tezos blockchain. Um, it covers the whole life cycle of a smart contract. So you, um, of course, can write a, con a smart contract with it, you can test it locally, and then you can pilot to Mikkelsen so that you can actually deploy it to the um, Tezos blockchain. Uh, furthermore, you once it's on the blockchain, you can interact with it, so uh, call its entry points and um, even have different contracts interact between them. Let me say a few words only about the architecture of SmartPy. So um, the core of the library is written in OCaml. Um, we call that SmartML. For the most, as a user, you don't see that um, because it is wrapped as a Python library. So that means it should look and feel just like any Python library. You write import your, like you import NumPy, you can import SmartPy. Um, and importantly, also, this allows you to do metaprogramming. So you can write contracts that write other contracts um, locally. And then deploy the, the 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 contract that has been written to the blockchain. Beyond the Python um, backend, we plan to uh, build other backends because of this architecture. You can uh, have different front ends, so one in JavaScript, for example, might make sense. Then, from the user perspective, uh, there are two interfaces. There's uh, SmartPy.io. That's our website. Uh, that is mostly what we're going. Um, to be using today and then there's a command line interface so um, if you don't like to move your mouse and click buttons you can uh, use that um, all right so now i'd like to show you a brief tutorial video and um, that lasts about 15 minutes and then i'm going to be back and uh, tell you a little bit more so let me change the window Here we go. Hello, and welcome to this introduction to SmartPy. SmartPy is a Python library for writing, testing, and deploying smart contracts. It allows you to use familiar Python concepts, such as classes and methods. These are compiled to Mikkelsen so that your contract can be deployed to the Tezos blockchain. To try out SmartPy, let's go to smartpy.io slash demo. Here you can play around with smart contracts without installing anything on your computer first. To get started, let's have a brief look at the menu bar. In the file menu, you have the option to load templates and examples. There is a long list of smart contracts and tests already written for you to look at and modify. In the view menu, amongst other things, you can change between a dark and a light theme. Finally, in the help menu, you can find the reference manual, which explains all aspects of SmartPy in detail. There is also a list of keyboard shortcuts for the editor. So let's write a smart contract. To begin with, we import the SmartPy library. Our first contract shall be a very simple one. So we define a Python class that we name counter.
In SmartPy, all contracts inherit from sp.contract. Next, we define the contract state. This is done in the classes constructor. With the call to self.init, we allocate a single field n. Initially, its value is zero. Now we'd like people to be able to call our contract. For this, we define a method and tag it as an entry point. Let's call it increment. What does this method do? For now, let's just increment our variable n by one. In SmartPy, the state of the contract is accessed as self.data. And that's it. We've just written our first smart contract. In order to do anything interesting with it, we still need to define a test. For this, we use the add test decorator. On a function simply called test. Inside the test, we define a so-called scenario. A scenario is an environment in which we can simulate one or several contracts. So we instantiate our contract. Add it to the scenario and call our entry point. We are now ready to run this scenario. This is simply done by clicking the Run button. As you can see, we are now shown our contract along with its balance and state, both initially zero. Then there's a transaction that corresponds to our call of the increment entry point in the scenario. We can jump there by clicking on the line number. The output shows us how the call has affected the contract state. As you might expect, in the new state, n is now 1. Next, let's click on Mickelson and then on Code. This shows the Mickelson code that our contract has been compiled to. Each SmartPy statement is included as a comment. And after each Mickelson instruction, you can see the resulting stack. Now let's make this slightly more interesting. First, let's modify the increment entry point so that the counter can be increased not just by one, but by any given number. For this, we add a parameter x to the entry point. And we replace one with x. Furthermore, let's add a second entry point that allows the caller to decrement the counter. Let's also modify our test. First, we add a section header and some text to the scenario. Let's now add the new parameter to the call to increment. And also call it a second time. And a third time. Finally, let's call the new decrement entry point. In a scenario, we can not only test our contract, but also check that certain conditions hold at certain points in time. This is done with a method called verify.
let's see. 100 plus 10 plus 1 minus 2 equals 109. Finally, let's be polite and say goodbye. Now let's run this scenario again. As you can see on the right hand side, the scenario now contains our header and text. As well as one transaction for each entry point call that we specified. Also, each transaction includes the updated state. Now let's suppose we had a bug in one of our entry points. For example, in the increment entry point, we could accidentally have written just equals instead of plus equals. Let's try this out and see what happens. Well, the call to verify now fails because due to our bug, n has a value different to 109. You can see this both in the dialog box that just popped up and in the scenario output on the right. Before going any further, let's fix this bug. Now it's time to deploy our contract to the blockchain. For this, we need a private key and some Tezos tokens to pay for gas. Luckily, on the testing networks, both can be obtained for free from the so-called faucet. Let's open SmartPy's hamburger menu and select the Tezos faucet at portal. We click on the link to the faucet, tell it that we are not a robot, and obtain our faucet data. From this, we can compute our private key. Let's remember it, because we will need it later. The next step is activating the account. This may take a while. Once activation is done, proceed to reveal your account. We are now in the possession of a ready-to-use private key for deploying contracts. So let's hit the browser's back button to go back to our counter contract. To deploy a contract, we first run a scenario. Then click on Mikkelsen and deploy contract. Because we are only testing, we select CartageNet. We fill in our previously saved private key and simply press the deploy contract button. Our counter contract is now making its way to the blockchain. Using the SmartPy Explorer, you can explore any contract's current state and interact with it. Unsurprisingly, our counter contract has zero for its initial storage. So let's build a transaction to interact with it. First, let's increment the counter by 100. Again, we need our private key. We push send the transaction. Status applied means that the transaction was successful. Let's build the second transaction right away. This time we decrease the counter by five.
when we reload the browser page, the Explorer shows us the transactions of the contract in reverse chronological order. As we would expect, the latest value of the counter is 95. In about 10 minutes, we have written a smart contract, debugged it, deployed it to the blockchain, and interacted with it. If you'd rather write smart contracts in your favorite editor instead of on the website, you can do so with SmartPy's command line interface. Here is a regular Python file that contains our counter contract. SmartPy's command line interface, smartpy.sh, comes with online help available. In this demo, we're going to use only the test subcommand. This is equivalent to hitting the run button on the website. Its output goes into a number of different files. For example, there is the scenario interpreter log. It contains the result of each transaction, just like we saw it on the website. It also provides us with the compiled Mikkelsen code. There is much more to be said about SmartPy. To get an idea, let's skim through a few of the templates. The calculator contract implements various arithmetic operations. It makes use of loops to compute the square root and the factorial. A more advanced example is the chess contract, which implements the rules of the game of chess. It makes use of data structures, such as lists and maps. Another interesting contract is fungible assets. It implements a ledger, which maps identities to balances. It is also an example of how several participants can interact on the blockchain. This concludes our introduction to SmartPy. For more information, please refer to the reference manual or find us on Twitter, Telegram, the Tesla Stack Exchange, or GitLab. Thanks for listening and goodbye. Okay, um, so after this uh, introduction that should have given you a good idea of the basic functionality. I'd like to show you a few more um, uh, contracts as examples, a few more interesting ones. Um, let me pull up the right window for that. Sorry, this took a little longer than expected. Okay, um, 
So, uh, this is the first contract I'd like to talk about. Um, it models a fungible asset. So, um, let's simply go uh, over it. At the beginning, we have the constructor, and the contract has two fields, admin and balances. Um, admin is simply an administrator that has special rights, we'll get to that shortly, and balances is a ledger in which for each um, participant, we record how, much, uh, how many tokens they have. And by tokens, I mean um, not Tezos tokens, but uh, tokens that we um, model as in, in the fungible asset. Then there are two um, methods. So increase balance and decrease balance. Note that these are not tagged as an entry point. So in the video, we just saw that um, uh, entry points have to be tagged as such. Now, um, you can see here, um, this sp.if sp is, um, uh, means that this is executed on the chain. So there are two versions of the if. Uh, get to that in a little bit, but just don't be um, scared by this um, SP. So, in order to increase the balance of the account X, what do we do? Um, well, uh, we first check if that person already has an account with us. If so, we increase the account by the amount. Otherwise, um, we um, create a new account and set it to the amount. In decrease balance, um, it's the um, inverse game. So we um, uh, deduct the um, amount from that account and um, check that the account still has money in it. And then um, uh, if, if the balance has gone to zero, we, we remove the account. Otherwise, we update it to, with, the, with, with the new um, amount. Okay, um, now these are just two, two helper functions. Um, and the actual thing is uh, then happening here. So the transfer entry point um, allows you to send a, uh, um, to, to transfer money between um, uh, two accounts. So what does it do? Uh, well, it decreases the balance of the sender. So sp.sender is the uh, address of the person or contract that calls this entry point. And so that person gets money removed um, and the destination, which is a parameter here, uh, uh, that account is uh, increased. So that's our first entry point transfer, which allows uh, us to move money between two accounts. And then there's a second entry point that allows uh, the administrator to mint coins. So that is to print money. Um, the first thing we do here is call sp.verify. Uh, so as you saw in the introduction, that is a, a command that checks the Boolean condition. So uh, here we check that the sender is the administrator because nobody else should be allowed to, uh, to mint money. So if this condition is false, the transaction fails and, uh, and the following line is not executed. So otherwise, of course, if, the, if it is the administrator, then the destination uh, account is increased by the amount given. Okay, so uh, let's hit run and simulate this. So here's a little scenario. Um, so we've got three participants, the administrator, Alice and Bob. Um, here we set up the scenario, uh, instantiate the contract, so nothing really surprising here. And then here's a number of calls. So um, first we, um, so let me briefly change the layout here to make it slightly more readable. Um, the uh, so the first call is um, to mint, okay? We minting five coins for Alice. And the, um, this part here specifies the hat that we are wearing. So we're calling this entry point as the administrator. That's what this is saying, okay? Uh, second line, same thing again, just that this time the coins get credited to Bob. Um, 
then on, in the third line we um, transfer uh, three coins to Alice and we call it as uh, Bob this function okay and this is exactly the same thing again. I'll explain in a second what this valid false means. And um, then there's a, another uh, um, call to mint here. Yeah. So let's, let's run this. And look at the results. So as we previously saw, here we get the, um, uh, the contract itself. And uh, initially, uh, the administrator well is set to this address, and then the balances are um, it's an empty ledger. Let's briefly look at the types. So that's interesting. Um, so anything that starts with a capital T is a type in SmartPy, and here SmartPy automatically inferred that the administrator uh, is an address, and the balances are a big map from addresses to integers. So for each address, we, we, we record how, um, how many coins are in, 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 in that account. Note that we did not specify this. Uh, sorry, I'm lying. Uh, we did actually specify this year. But uh, uh, so here's address and integer. We did, um, we did not specify it for administrator. Um, so SmartPy inferred that administrator is an address based on how it is used. So specifically by comparing the administrator to the sender tells us that it's, it has to be a sender. So um, this is called type inference, as you may know from other programming languages. Now, uh, back to the example. Um, let's look at how our transaction is played out. So here's the first transaction. Um, so Alice gets five tokens, five coins. Um, the resulting state of this is, um, well, this is Alice's address, and so that with the XH here, and it has five coins now. Um, next transaction, um, same thing for Bob. So now, for the first time, the ledger looks slightly more interesting. So we now have two entries here, one for Alice and one for Bob. Um, want to know who is who, so let's briefly make this uh, crystal clear. So um, here in the header of the transaction, we see by whom it was called, okay? So this corresponds to sender equals admin. And as you can see uh, up here, the administrator has the address tz1 vb blah, blah, blah. And that's the same thing that appears here. And then here are the two entries, uh, both for five. So this is TZ1ML and TZ1XH, which are, of course, uh, Alice and Bob. Okay, so now let's move on to the third transaction, which is a transfer. So nothing very surprising here, it worked. Uh, um, uh, Bob sent uh, three coins to Alice, so now he has two left and she now has eight. Then Bob tries to do the same thing again, um, send three coins to Alice, but as you can see, there are only two coins left in his account, so this has to fail. And uh, it does fail, that's why it says KO and it's in red, and it even tells us which line it failed on. So when I click here, um, it um, jumps to line 16, which is exactly the point where, where we verify that the, um, well, basically the, the, the sender has to have enough money. And then there's the last transaction um, where Bob tries to print money. So note that uh, the sender is Bob here and that fails too. Why? Well, because Bob is not allowed to print money, only the administrator is, remember? And of course, this takes us to, um, sorry, uh, line 29 here, which checks exactly that. Um, this uh, valid equals false here um, simply means that this is not an error. So in writing a test, sometimes it's useful to um, also test that things fail, right? We, if, you, if you write a more complex contract where it's not obvious, um, that, that 
uh, certain conditions uh, lead to failure, but you want them to fail, then you then it's a, a good way to test it. Um, if any of the attendees have a, any questions so far, now is a good time to ask. Otherwise, I'll just carry on. All right. Um, well, we can, uh, let's try to deploy this contract. Um, so, um, well, just uh, push the deploy button as we saw previously. Uh, I prepared a few keys here. So let's use the administrator key to deploy it. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I apologize, I got lost in my tabs, so try again. Um, deploy contract. Okay, that seems to have worked. Now let's explore it. So this usually takes uh, a few seconds. Um, so it's now probably going to tell us that the contract is not uh, on the chain yet. That's because uh, we need to wait for the next block to be produced. So let's just hit reload. Um, let's give it another chance, otherwise I have a backup. Hmm. Okay, no problem. Let's just uh, work with the, with the backup example then. Um, So trying once more. Hmm, still not out. So let's use the backup example. Here we go. Um, so this is the contract uh, that um, has just been deployed. So it's exactly the same thing. Uh, just we waited a little longer. And uh, initially, there's only one operation which corresponds to the um, to the origina origination itself. Now let's interact with it. So here we can build operations. So um, here's a pull down menu with our two entry points, mint and transfer. And let's just do what uh, um, uh, we did in this in the scenario. So we start by uh, minting uh, five coins and credit them to Alice. Now. To find out who Alice is, uh, we need to copy her um, account number. And so here. Uh, okay, so now I'm going to build this message. And I enter the uh, private key here. So the, this is importantly, it's the administrator's uh, private key. Hmm? It's only you can mint money. And uh, now I just send off the transaction. Okay. So um, let us see how this plays out. And I reload. So there's only one operation, which is the origination itself. Now, um, we can reload again. Hmm. Oh, I'm just being told there's a technical issue on CartageNet right now. So um, that's a little bit unfortunate. Um, um, well, let's hope it is going to be resolved soon and um, then uh, you can try out this as an exercise. So 
Um, let's see. So not entirely sure, but let's, uh, yeah. Okay, so um, maybe this is a good exercise to repeat later. And, uh, but the important thing to remember from here is that you've got this uh, pull down menu where you, where you can call the entry points from your contract um, through the message, enter your private key, send it off, and then it uh, should be visible here. I have another backup contract that where we actually should be the result, be able to see the result that we expect. Um, Okay, I just like to emphasize this is not a SmartPy issue. This is a, a, a some issue with the testing network of uh, Kartagenet probably, or or something else. <laughs> um, all right, uh, so let's get back to uh, smart contracts uh, in SmartPy and maybe try this again later. Close a few things. Um, maybe. That one. Okay, so here's a different contract. Um, so this is a game of tic-tac-toe. Um, so you have a three by three uh, board and uh, two players. Um, so let's look at the uh, constructor. Here we have, uh, we initialize the board. Um, um, initially all the fields are minus one. Then we have two players and that we put in the map. So this is Python syntax uh, for a map. So she has zero with player one and one with player two. Um, and the next player, we will just remember whose turn it is at, at, at any given moment in time. Then there's the play entry point. Um, well, the player needs to specify the row and the column where they would like to put their, their tick or their circle. And uh, what happens here is, um, so P is just an abbreviation for the next player, and um, we check that this is uh, non negative, otherwise, the game is over. And we also check it's, that it's the player, uh, only the player whose turn it is can play, otherwise, um, the transaction fails with the message, not your turn. Right, so, um, but then we look at the board. So again, we abbreviate the board as B. And if um, the, 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 the contents of the board at row, at the, at the specified row and column is not minus one, then uh, we fail again. Otherwise, we assign P to it. So we remember who's uh, the, the, the player that, that, that take that box off. Um, then the uh, slightly longer oops, uh, part here is uh, simply to determine whether the game is over or not. So in tic-tac-toe, you can win by occupying a diagonal, which is checked in this loop here. Okay. Um, so, uh, and, and, and you can, uh, I'm sorry, you, you, the, the loop checks uh, whether <laughs> uh, any of the horizontal or vertical lines are uh, entirely occupied by the player who just moved. Okay. And then uh, there are two diagonals which are checked here. And um, maybe worth noting that done is a so called local variable. So um, local variables are initialized with a call to uh, spp.local. And we repeat the name here. This is just for um, uh, documentation purposes. And initially, the value is false. Um, well, if any of these uh, assignments here sets it to true, then we know that the game is over. In that case, well, we know that the person who just moved is the winner. And the winner gets one to token. So this is a Tezos token here. 
and and we set this to a negative number here the next player so just to remember that the game is over otherwise um well we toggle the next player nothing exciting here and here's a little helper function that we uh, that we called up here check row so um just the boolean condition and then here uh, our usual suspects alice and bob play again and uh, test scenario is initialized and we uh, have a few moves here so let's let's see how these uh, play out okay so uh, yeah, initially the board is minus one everywhere let me zoom in here um, then we had a, uh, a move uh, to the, uh, zero zero so you can see how the board is updated and then the other player moves to two zero uh, board is updated again and so on and so on until um, uh, they decided not to play anymore um, All right, uh, let me move on to a third example, namely, um, oh, sorry, the, the main point of this contract was I wanted to show you meta programming. So um, the, um, there is for any game, you can come up with a so-called misere game, misery game. And, that means you inverse the rules. So somebody who is uh, uh, the the winner becomes the loser, and the loser becomes the winner. So with chess, this is quite interesting. But um, um, or you can also do it with tic tac toe. Um, okay. So let's see how we how we would implement this. Um, so we'd like to give the option to um, the, this tic tac toe uh, contract to be initialized as a misere uh, uh, in misere mode. So we specif specify that here. Um, and so this is how you would usually do it, right? So you you add a um, another field, and well, we have, I simply have a boolean here, is there, and um, uh, check that then at the uh, time that the winner is determined. So um, so here we will check uh, if. We we are in the in the misere mode. Um, then indeed the other player um, is going to be the winner. Okay, so not uh, uh, not the sender, but uh, indeed the the other one. Okay, and uh, sorry. The, otherwise, we just leave it as it was. Okay. Um, now, I would have to, um, in order for this to work, actually, I would have to have the wi winner as a local variable here. Briefly write that out. Now, this is how you would uh, um, implement it um, sort of naively. But uh, what you actually want to do is uh, not do this because uh, there's a problem with this. So um, here uh, we have a constant that is going to remain on the chain that is never going to be uh, changed. And uh, as you know, uh, you have um, things cost money, uh, meaning uh, storage is, uh, um, uh, well, you pay for it. So adding, deploying a field to the chain is uh, problematic uh, if, it, if it doesn't change. So let's not deploy it. Let's simply, um, instead of putting it uh, into the storage, let's just remember it locally. Okay. And in that case, uh, let's uh, We don't need sp.if, but uh, if, because we're doing Python, not SmartPy. 
and we can get rid of this part as well. And since we're not, uh, um, since winner, uh, since it's not taking on the taking place on the chain, we don't need the winner local variable either. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I made a mistake here. Uh, what I meant to write, and this is also valid for the previous version, is, uh, is this. So we, we look up the player in our uh, player's map, and we want the one that is uh, not the current player. OK, so um, this is just a very simple example of metaprogramming. So let me um, just highlight the, the main point of this. Uh, we're not, we're having a variable here that we decide does not belong on the chain, right? So it doesn't, it's not like board and the player is the next player, but we simply put it into the class itself. Um, that of course, it means it is not accessible uh, uh, once the contract is deployed. And uh, this is reflected here in uh, if misere. We, we are writing Python if not the smart pi. If, then that is for this reason. Okay, um, then let me move on to another example. So that is the um, Collets uh, conjecture. So this function here, um, that uh, is a number from integers to in, uh, a function from integers to inter, in, integers, um, defines a series. So if um, n is even, we divide by two. Otherwise, we multiply by three and add one. So for example, this leads to the following sequence here. We have 12, well, that's even, so we simply divide by two and get six, which is even again. Uh, so we divide by two and get three, which is odd. And now we uh, multiply by three and add one and get 10 and so on. So there's a conjecture that says that this sequence um, always terminates. Um, Let's just compute the sequence uh, on the blockchain. Um, and to do this, so we could simply write a contract that, uh, that computes this using a loop um, uh, or, or repeated calls. But let's make this slightly more interesting by uh, distributing the computation over several contracts. So here, um, you, on the left, you can see three contracts. Uh, on even, on odd, and collards. And um, they communicate with each, with each other to compute the sequence. So let's see um, where to start. Uh, right, so on even um, simply uh, divides by two, okay. But what does it do with the result? It doesn't assign it to anything but it immediately calls another contract, which um, I'll show you in a second. Uh, and so where does this contract come from? So it's params.k, and it means the run entry point takes two parameters, k, which is the contract uh, that we would like to be called back at, and x is the number. And we had the same thing for uh, odd. So this is the other case and um, where um, we make a callback again, but this time with uh, um, 3x plus 1. And by the way, this is a, a type annotation here. So we, we're specifying um, that x is a natural number and not an integer, because in Tezos there are uh, nat and int. And in, for the most part in SmartPy, this is uh, there's a mechanism to um, that that, that um, sort of handles this automatically, so you don't need to worry about this. But in, in some cases, uh, you want to be explicit. Then we had the main contract here, so um, Collatz. So we're working with the Collatz contractor here, and um, well, it takes two addresses as uh, arguments and a counter. And the counter is initially zero. 
Then we have a reset entry point that simply sets the counter to zero. And um, the more interesting entry point is run. So um, what's happening here is that we simply, um, first there's a, li a little setup here. So we um, pull up the two contracts. So go, sp.contract goes from an address to a contract. Okay, so not any address represents a contract. So for example, you can have a faulty address that's, uh, that's not resolving. So um, open underscore sum checks the result of that and says if it, um, um, if it resolves to an address, then um, assign it to on even, otherwise fail. And then we do the same thing for on odd again. Then the interesting bit is done here. So if uh, we haven't reached one yet, which is uh, when we terminate, uh, we increase the counter and make a call according to um, the parity of x. So if x is even, we call on even. And um, so this record here is uh, uh, the, um, are the arguments to the, to the uh, two contracts we specified up here. So we set the, the callback to ourselves. So sp.self entry point is where we would like to be called back at. So this is saying, um, this is telling on even to call us back here again. So we have a kind of recursion. Um, and uh, same thing here with uh, on odd. Okay. So um, let's uh, see if we can um, deploy this, or maybe I'll just show you an example. Uh, Okay, so um, maybe it's best if I uh, show you one example. And this has been run. Um, okay, so this is my backup example. Let me let me see if the if the blockchain is back. Maybe maybe let's uh, let's let's see what happens. Um, all right. So here on the right hand side, you can you can see there are three gray boxes. Um, they correspond to uh, the three contacts we, we wrote here on even or not and call us. So let's uh, originate them uh, one by one. So we click on Mickelson for the first one, deploy the contract, and insert the private key. And let's just use the administrator account for that. And um, here we go. Um, let's push the button here. And let's um, okay. Let's let's just leave that tab open, and in the meantime, uh, deploy the other contract, the odd contract. Uh, same key, and deploy the contract, and then let's also originate the the main contract. Okay, now let's see if this actually has worked. So the first one should be should be ready by now. Oh good, there it is. Okay. And ah, okay, so I made one little mistake here. Um So the, the main contract takes two other contracts as an argument, okay? So um, here we are. Um, they, they, they're specified down here. So 
And of course, I want the um, to use the contract I just deployed. So let me copy these addresses here. Oh, so it looks like this one has not originated yet. Okay, I'm sorry for the slightly chaotic um, thing going on here. Um, let me just summarize what's, uh, what we're trying to do here. So we, we are originating three contracts, okay? The three contracts uh, we have here, we want one instance of, of each. Um, the third contract, as parameters needs uh, need needs the, the the addresses of the first two contracts. So that means we can only originate it. It has to be originated as the last one and take the results of the first two originations as arguments. Um, so this is why we have to go back uh, go back, uh, back and forth once. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, during this presentation right now, there seems to be a technical issue. Um, probably with the with the testing network um, I'm not entirely sure what it is so let me just show you an example instead that I, I prepared and so this is what I, I ran this morning doing exactly what I just showed you um, so uh, um, so this is the this is an instance of the of the main contract operations and uh, um, the transactions are shown in reverse chronological order, so we have to start on the bottom. And so I'm trying to reproduce um, this example here. So starting with 12. And so this is a transaction that was run with 12. Okay. And what's interesting here is that we get an outbound internal operation. So this you don't usually see uh, on, uh, on many, most contracts you don't see that, but this is a contract calling another one. Okay, so, and then from that contract, we get called back uh, with a six, and which is, uh, well, 12 uh, divided by two is six. And we go up, uh, we get uh, six divided by three is three, and um, three, times three plus one is 10. So, and so on and so on. So um, this uh, is an example of um, communication between contracts. Um, specifically these, these three here. Um, all right. Um, I think this may be a good point to, to conclude. Let me just... Uh, Maybe pull up the um, our contacts again. For more information, um, Hey, Roland, I'm not sure uh, your audio cut out or something. Oh, here, sorry, here we go. Um, can you see this? Yes. Um, okay. Oh, uh, one last thing um, I wanted to mention is that um, please on the smartpy.io uh, website uh, slash demo. Um, it is also mentioned in the directory video that I showed at the beginning. Um, if you go to the file menu, there are templates and examples. And uh, there's a treasure trove of uh, things you can try out for yourself. So I recommend to begin with, you can look at the contract that is called Welcome. Um, it's uh, very easy to read and uh, you, you could, for example, try to deploy that. Um, or um, for uh, the second step, perhaps I would suggest the calculator con contract uh, with it, that was also mentioned in the, in the video. 
Okay, thanks very much to everyone. Uh, here are our uh, contacts. Um, please follow us on Twitter or uh, uh, join the Telegram channel and ask questions and uh, we will try to reply. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, thanks for your time again, uh, Roland. Um, yeah, so if you have any questions, like Roland mentioned, you can uh, message here. And uh, if you have any other like general uh, hackathon questions, feel free to toss the questions into the uh, Discord channel. Um, which is included in the description links of all these workshops and uh, on the Hackathon website. So yeah, so uh, we have a few more Hackathon workshops coming up, um, both this week and next week, so stay tuned. And thank you all, and this will be on YouTube after this. Thanks. Have a good one, everyone.